everyone and welcome to Grace Church Online. My name is Brittany Canfield and I get to be the creative pastor here at Grace. I'm so glad that you are joining us today. Hey, did you know that you can watch through our website for our online interactive service? We have a host available to chat and pray with you every Sunday at 9 a.m. Go ahead and let us know where you are watching from in the chat. Join us on Monday, January 24th for Missions Per Night. We will gather in room eight from seven to 8 p.m. here at Grace. It's a great opportunity to connect in relationship with our partners and to connect with God in prayer. We believe that prayer changes us and changes lives. Come join us in this great opportunity. If you loved our fall session for Project 119, then we have great news. Project 119 is starting up again on February 1st. Join us as we walk through the book of John on Tuesday night starting at 6.30. If you'd like to sign up, head to our website under events and click the Tuesday nights. Child care will be available. We can't wait to be transformed by the word of God. Hey, Grace guys, get ready for our next men's breakfast. It'll be from on Saturday, February 5th from 7.30 to 9 a.m. right here at Grace. Come and enjoy a hot cooked breakfast, a message, some laughs and good fellowship. If you have any questions, reach out to Keith Nelson. He's your guy. We have exciting news. Grace Church is turning 40 this February. That's right, 40. On February 6th, we will have a very special service to honor all the people who have made and make this place Grace Church. You can join us at 9 or 11 a.m. in person or online at 9 a.m. Right now we are collecting stories and photos, so we would love it if you'd share a special story during your time here. Just head to our website and share your photos or stories under our events page. We can't wait to celebrate all that God has done in and through Grace Church. Well, that's it for announcements. Would you join me as I pray before worship? Dear God, we thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you for every single person who is watching right now. Lord, I pray that you'd come and meet them. Whatever they're walking through, Lord, I pray that you would remind them that you are with them. Lord, we truly love you and we just praise you. And we pray all this in your mighty name. Amen. tries to roll over my bones and sorrow comes to steal the joy I want when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't Stand a chance when I stand in all love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in all love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies No, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in all love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love When I'm standing in your love There's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection 
doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. I want to welcome you. So glad you've joined us. We're in a series called Four Weeks to 40 as we are kind of pausing and celebrating the fact that Grace Church in just a couple of weeks will turn 40 years old. And we're looking back and reflecting uh, all the good things that God has done throughout the years. Uh, Sometimes I'll get the question, you know, Dave, how did you get to to, to go to a place and stay so long. And what, what was it about your life that got you, know, got you to do what you're doing? And, and uh, I, I grew up in a home where my mom and dad had seen their parents uh, come to know Christ. My mom, when she was eight years old, um, she, through a miraculous healing, um, her parents... Uh, my mother was healed in, in a miraculous way, and, and her parents became full-time followers of Jesus. And my, my, my dad, uh, his mom, actually, had, had come, become a follower of Jesus. So when they met and married, they were uh, to, uh, second-generation believers, and yet they had seen their parents come to know the Lord Jesus, so it affected their lives greatly. And, and church was very, very important to their lives. So I, I grew up, I think it was probably the first or second week after I was born, going to church all my life. And church was really a focal point of our week. For my dad, he owned his own business and he would uh, literally uh, work six days a week, long hours. And, and so Sundays became both the beginning of the week and also the end of the week. And, and it was Sundays were the day that I saw my dad the most. We, it looked like this at our house growing up. Uh, you would get up and the kids would kind of be in a hurry to get around, to get to church, to get to Sunday school at that time at 9.45. And so the, my mom would get us all in the car and we'd get there and usually often a little bit late and, and we'd go to Sunday school. And I, as a kid, was just, I just knew I was loved there. I was accepted there. It was fun to be there. And, and then, then we'd have a, a church service at 11. 11 o'clock, and then we'd go home, and uh, often we'd have these big Sunday meals, and often the, the meal was cooked all morning while we were away, and there was this great Sunday meal, followed by a nice nap, and after the nap, we would pack it back up to get to the 6 o'clock service on Sunday night, and, and that was our Sunday. And that's what I so often remember growing up. And, of course, then there was this midweek service at 7 o'clock on Wednesday also that we'd often go to. And so our week uh, often involved, it was just kind of started and ended with, with church. And it was the, the one time I could count on our whole family being together. And, and our, ch- our family, my family of origin, it really revolved a lot around church and uh, another thing that affected me was this. When I was seven years old, our church got a new pastor. His name was J.P. Wheeler. And uh, I was seven. He came. He was a great guy. And he pastored that church for 10 years. Well, in those days, staying for 10 years was, wasn't something that happened very often. Typically, uh, pastors would stay between someplace between uh, four and six years. Often, even before that, they would change and go to another uh, church. And, and so there would be this constant change of pastors. But JP came when I was seven, and he stayed for 10 years. And when I left to go to college, he actually left to go to, to another assignment. So it was one of those things that we left the same summer So in so many ways, in my mind, he kind of never left. He was still there. And just having the consistency of that pastor in my life for those 10 years that were very formative to me was just just something that I treasured. And 
I remember at college studying for the ministry and, and having uh, influenced, uh, being influenced, I should say, by other pastors who had gone someplace and stayed for a long period of time. And, and I saw the fruit of that. I saw the benefit of that. So when I was praying and we were looking at what our assignments would be after school and at the beginning of ministry, I, I literally said, said, Lord, I will go anywhere. I will go anywhere you want me to go. However, Lord... <laughs> If it's okay with you, I would like to stay wherever I go. And I know that was a high value I had. It's wherever I go, I want to stay. And, and so as my story went on, I, my first ministry assignment, it wasn't uh, about a year and a half into that assignment, uh, that church had a pastoral change. And so uh, when the past, a new pastor came, and it wasn't long after that, that, that uh, I was then invited to find another position. And so we were looking for another position, and, and I was interviewed by a pastor, and he said to me, he said, listen, I'm tired of staff coming and going. I'm looking for someone to stay. And I said, sign me up. I want to stay. And, and, and so he said, great, you're hired. And he hired me in May. I, I started the assignment the 1st of July. And, and he had gone, had some vacation planned and so on and so forth. He, he came back from a retreat after the Labor Day weekend in September. He came back and here it is. He resigned the church and went to a different assignment. And here's a guy who said, I'm looking for permanency. And he had just left me. And it was like, what happened here? And, and so it, all of a sudden, I went through this second pastoral transition. And, and, and on the other side of that came to the realization, if I was going to stay somewhere, I was going to need to be not a, not a staff pastor, which is what I wanted to be, but I was going to need to be a lead pastor. And so w through some other situations that came about, we came here to Camas and came to East County and began Grace Church. And, and, and it really was a desire to go someplace and stay and live. When I read this verse out of First Thessalonians. Uh, as Paul poured out his heart to this church, I just so, so much identified with this verse that says this, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our very lives as well. Because you were so dear to us. Paul, affectionately writing to this church, saying, listen, it wasn't just the gospel we gave. We gave our very lives. And I think that's what church is all about. I think that's what community is all about. I, I think that's really how we should think about who we are as a church. Now, two weeks ago, I began this series, Four Weeks to 40, and I talked about the fact that our mission statement is to be uh, uh, loving God by becoming authentic and credible followers of Jesus. And, and as we start thinking about that, and we think about what does that look like, and how can I be a person who grows spiritually, we, we as a church, has, we've identified some things that we, can, we think really does describe spiritual growth. And the, and the first is trusting God. That's foundational. It always has to start with God, that we trust God. And, and we've called that intimacy with God, this idea that I am trusting Jesus today and I'm growing in my trust of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this verse in Proverbs, this verse that says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And that's so foundational, it's so important that we understand that our trust in God should be with all of our heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your paths straight. That is such great news. It's such a, a good description of how we are trusting God. And we can measure that. We can ask ourselves the question, am I trusting him today more than I was three months ago or six months ago or six years ago? And am I, in times of crisis, 
Am I going to him? Am I going to the word and reading it on a consistent basis? And I'm, am I praying, effectively praying about situations when, when things come up? And I can measure whether or not I'm growing and trusting in God. We've also identified two other areas that I, we think are very important. The second is community, a community with believers. And, and I'm gonna spend the bulk of my time talking about that today. And the, and the third thing is a bold witness or an influence in this world and how we see people who are outside the family of God and a far away from God. And as a church, those are the things that we're focused on. Now, here's the deal. Going back to this idea of community, this verse out of 1 Thessalonians, it says, we loved you so much that we delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well because you had become so very dear to us. Church, we need one another. We need to be in the community of believers. Being in a community of believers really is not, I don't believe, is an option. And, and I wanted to say this really boldly. I am to be a person who never, ever walks alone. And when I wrote that and I put that out, I'm never to walk alone. I thought to myself, is that too strong to say it that way? And, and I really don't think it is too strong at all. If, if, if I want to be somebody who pursues spiritual growth, if I want to be healthy spiritually, if I, I need relationships, I need a, com, a, a community of believers surrounding me. In fact, I don't believe that that community of believers is really an option when it comes to healthy spiritual growth. This is what it says in Ephesians. It says, from him, from Jesus, the whole body, that's all of us, every one of us, are joined and held together by every supporting ligament. It grows and builds itself up in love as each one does its part. And Ephesians is describing how so important it is to be connected to each other. And, and the illustration of a, a physical body, that, the, that a healthy physical body is connected to each other. Let me tell you something. It's so easy to illustrate that if, if, you, if, you, if your arm was disconnected and laying over there somewhere, you would realize really quick, that's not healthy. You know, if some part of your body was, was somehow, you, you took it out and it wasn't part of your body, you, you go, wait a minute. There's just nothing about that is healthy. In order to have real physical health, we need to stay all of our parts connected to each other. And so it is in God that we need to truly be connected. Uh, Philippians says it this way. It says, each one should look not only to your own interest, but also the interest of others. We need to look out for each other. Ecclesiastics has this verse that is, is uh, I, I th think, is so descriptive, and it says this, two are better than one. It's a great statement. Two are better than one. And if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But here's the, what it goes on and says. Is, it says, but pity. Think about it. Pity. Pity the man who falls and there is no one there, no one around to pick him up. Over the years, I've watched people fall. And often, one of the characteristics about people who fall is that there's really no one in their life, no one surrounding them. So when they fall, there's no one who will pick them up. Proverbs, this verse that most of us know, it says, iron sharpens iron, so, so one man sharpens another. If we're going to be sharp, we need one another. We need to have a, a connection with other people. And, and so... so we need to recognize the fact that isolation is a problem. Uh, 
people do tend to, to isolate. And over the last two years, this whole idea of isolation and, and, and that has really caused some challenges because here's the, the, the thing about isolation. The first problem is this, is it lose, people lose perspective when they're isolated. We've seen it. We hear about it. We hear about these groups. We hear about these uh, individuals who have lost perspective because they're isolated. And, and, and there's nobody who is around them that will call them back towards balance. When you're isolated, uh, there's this loss of perspective where the lows become really, really low and the highs become really high and, 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 and there's no one around to bring peop- you back to balance and to truth. Folks, as believers in Jesus, we're in a battle. And one of the strategies of the enemy is to isolate, isolate people. And, and, and in that, he, the enemy picks us off, as it were. I know the, the children of Israel and their story of the wilderness journey, the ones that would drop back, the ones who would separate from the group, they were the ones that would be picked off by the enemy. Uh, when people are isolated, there, there comes a fear of intimacy. And, and people, uh, when they don't have good, healthy relationships, uh, there's a tendency to start to fear those relationships. Those, it, it's a tendency when you don't have a close friend or if you don't have a close connect, connection, you start to think, well, well, if people get to know me, they won't like me. And so again, they'll people will start to reject others because there becomes a fear of that. There's a selfishness that happens in isolation. Isolated people start to be very self-centered. They're disconnected by, uh, from other people and they become self-absorbed and, and, and it really does get into self-centeredness. Isolated people also tend to have poor health. It actually affects our physical health. I I was reading some John Orberg, and in his book, he wrote this. He said, researchers have found that most isolated people were were three times more likely to die than those with strong relational connections. People who had bad health habits, such as smoking, eating poorly, uh, even using alcohol, but strong social ties lived actually significantly longer than those people who had great health habits, yet were isolated. And then he concludes this way. He says, in other words, it's better to eat Twinkies with friends than to eat broccoli alone. (laughs) Well, listen, I don't know if I'm so sure about that, but I'll tell you this. Henry Cloud, who's a clinical psychologist, he said this. He said, "A, a, a person's ability to love and connect with others lays the foundation for both psychological and physical health. See, living without meaningful relationships is not good because that is not the way God created us to be. It was not God's intent for us to be isolated. He created us for relationships. In fact, God works out his purpose in the context of relationships. And that's why relationships are to be full of ministry. My relationships with other people and your relationships are absolutely supposed to be full of ministry where we serve each other, where we care for each other, where we bring each other to Jesus. One of of my favorite disciples is Andrew. And you think, well, Andrew, you don't hear much about Andrew. And the the reality is you don't. In fact, in all the Gospels, other than the list of of disciples uh, where Jesus or the Gospels list out the 12, in all the Gospels, Andrew only shows up three times. And yet what's special about it is this. Every time Andrew shows up in the Gospels, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. It was Andrew who brought his brother, Peter, who is kind of one of the stars of the disciples. It was Andrew who brought 
Peter to Jesus. When they were out in the wilderness and they needed food to be eaten and, and Jesus said, what do you have? It was Andrew who brought the boy with the basket and, and the food, the, the, the loaves and the fishes. It was Andrew who brought him. And, and right at the end, right before the cross, the, the, the gospels tell us that there were some Greek men who were looking for Jesus. And it was Andrew who brought those men to Jesus. See, our relationships need to be full of ministry, bringing people to Jesus. And that's why James writes this. And he says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed, so the healing would take place. And this happens in the context of relationships. And it says, whoever turns a sinner from his error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sin. Now, you may have heard this idea, this phrase that says, hurt people hurt people. And, and I found that to be true, that when people are hurt, they lash out and hurt others. But here's the beauty. Healed people are who heal people. And when people are in healthy relationships and they get healed, then what happens is they begin to bring healing to other people. Hurt people may hurt people, but there's a place where we can be healed. And healed people bring healing to each other. And that's why when Peter says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. I just wanted you to take a minute and consider some things. First of all, I want you to think about and consider the life of Jesus. It says this, that Jesus appointed 12 and designated them to be apostles and that they might be, catch this, that they might be with him that they would be with him. He, he literally had this small group of the 12 disciples that were connected and that were with him and, and that he may send them out to preach. And when he sent them, he never sent them alone. He always sent them by twos. And, 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 and ministry happens as we're connected with each other. Uh, 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 during the most difficult times of Jesus' life, Right before the cross, he, he called his 12 disciples. He called them to be with him. And after, after the resurrection, the first thing Jesus did was brought those disciples back together again. He, he just wanted to be with them. Consider, think about the fact that Jesus poured so much into his relationship with the disciples. Also think about the early church. Consider the church when it began. I, I love this description in Acts chapter two. And it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. This is what was critical in the early church. The, the teaching of the apostles, fellowship, breaking of bread and, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe. Ah, and sometimes I think there's an awe factor missing and it's because we're missing the relational factor of when we're connected with each other and, and living life with each other. And speaking about living life with each other, just consider the, what I call the one another's in the New Testament. When you read the New Testament, there's this over and over this phrase, one another, that we are to, be, uh, to do things one another. In other words, you can't do it independently. It has to be in context of relationship. And, and, and it is so important. The Bible is true when, when the Bible says something once. And yet when the Bible repeats itself over and over on a subject, we really, really need to pay attention. And 10 times... The Bible says we're to love one another. Ten times. Not once, not twice, not five times. Ten times. 
Love one another. This is so critical. Uh, and, and one time it says, love one another deeply from the heart. It, scripture says we're to accept one another. It, it also says not only we to accept one another, we're to greet one another. And in fact, it doesn't just say it once. It says it four times. We're to greet one another. I, I think about that, and I think about just coming together as a church, and we think about the fact we have greeters, and, and, and I want you to know that you can be assigned a greeter. You don't, it's not a job somebody else is supposed to have. We're all to be greeters. We're to greet one another. As scripture says we're to serve one another. It, it says we're to bearing, bearing with one another. And maybe right now there's somebody in your life, another believer that you're bearing with right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little tough. And yet that's what we're called to do. We're to bear with one another. We're to have compassion with one another and, and feel toward that movement of, of feeling and emotion. Uh, we're to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I, I, I'm not 100% what, sure what that's all about. You maybe want to turn to each other and just start singing. I don't know. But the bottom line is there should be praise coming out of our lips when it comes to our relationships with each other. Scripture says we're to teach and to admonish one another. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, scripture says we're to encourage one another. In fact, again, that's another one that is repeated three times. We're to encourage one another. One of the times it says it literally this way, encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. So anytime you live in a time that is called today, your assignment is to encourage someone. Encourage one another. Scripture says we're to spur one another along in love and good deeds. And the scripture says we're to offer hospitality. Now, as you see that list of all the things that we're to do, and all of those things cannot be done independently. Loved ones, if we're going to live the life of the New Testament, it has to be done in the context of relationships and community. You have to get to know each other enough to live this way. This is what Jesus says. It's recorded in John chapter 13. It says this, Jesus said, this is a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, so that you must, you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Folks, again, the New Testament is very, very clear. We are called to live in the context of community. So what do we do? I want to just finish up by saying what is it that we're to do? Well, I think we actually have to fight isolation. In fact, I think it's something we have to purposely say, I am not going to remain isolated. I'm going to do something. I'm going to, I'm going to take some steps. And, and, and I need someone else in my life. I love the Psalms that says, God has set the lonely in the family. I love that for two reasons. First of all, it says anyone to anyone who's lonely, you're invited and God has actually placed you in the family of God. Now, it also tells anyone here, all of us, people who are part of the family of God, that it, God has actually placed the lonely, single people, individuals in our lives. And we are to be people who receive those individuals and invite them in. I love where Romans chapter 15 says, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise to God. That our very acceptance of one another will bring praise to God. And in this culture where it has so much division and so much separation, God has called his church to accept one another. Uh, Romans goes on, and Romans chapter 12 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love and honor one another above 
yourself. Again, that's, this is something you have to do on purpose. It won't be done by accident. Uh, Peter says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. <laughs> and I think Peter knows it's, it's hard sometimes to just have people in your home and have hospitality. But he says, listen, do it without grumbling. Again, the scripture is so clear that we're to love one another, live in harmony, that we're not to be proud, we're to encourage each other, we're to be people who stop passing judgment on one another and, and to serve and to be kind and compassionate and to, be, to, to bear with and to forgive one another. All those words are words that have to do with community and connection and relationship and cannot be done alone. We have to fight isolation. And then we are to discover. Discover the strength, the power, the beauty of community. It is so great when the church gathers in the name of Jesus. God wants to show himself as we gather. And I think about the story of the Bible, how God shows himself in creation, then God shows himself in the nation of Israel, and then God shows himself now in his church. He displays who he is. And again, that's in the context of a group of people, a community of believers who truly, truly love each other. These verses out of Hebrews, somebody called them once the solid verses because it starts this way, let us. And it repeats this, let us, over and over again. So here's the solid verses. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promises is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds and let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another and all the more as we, you see the day approaching. Folks, again, those verses have to be done in community and with other people. Jesus said this truth. It's recorded in Matthew 18, where two or three come together in my name. There I am with them. Folks, that verse really tells us that when even a couple or three people get, are, are together in a relationship and Jesus is, his, they're coming together in his, in his name, that Jesus is the focus, there is a strength and there's a power, there's something, a purpose, and, and God is in that. Our relationships are important. And a community of believers is so critical. And, and I'm so thankful for this community of believers. I'm so grateful for the time I've been here and so grateful for the fact that I've been able to live life with you. And I'm so grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ and the people he has placed in my life. I hold them as treasures. And I want us all to hold one another as treasures so that the world will see Jesus in us. Church, community is critical. Let's make sure that we're connecting with each other, that we're caring for each other, that we're loving each other in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your grace. And I pray right now for anyone who feels lonely, feels isolated, and they recognize they fa the fact that they are isolated and lonely. I, I pray that they will ha be bold and take steps and, and find people to connect with in the, the community of believers. And I pray in your name as believers in Jesus that we will receive one another, that people will be strengthened 
in our relationships and encouraged, I ask. Lord, help us, renew us uh, in our commitment for community and relationship so that we will be stronger, so Jesus would be seen clearer in your name, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. Well, God bless you. So glad you've joined us. So glad that you're connecting. And I hope that this week will be a great week for you. God bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining us online today. We would love to connect with you. If you have any questions or would like more information, let our house know in the chat, or you can visit gracechurch360.org. Another way to connect with us is on Instagram or Facebook. Grace Church, I hope you have a beautiful day.